Um, first, welcome all of you to UNU Center for Policy Research. It's wonderful that you all took the time during this incredibly busy week to talk about this issue. Um, Secretary General Guterres started this UNGA week last week by really highlighting the urgency surrounding climate challenge. He particularly pointed to the recent catastrophic flooding in Pakistan and warned that unless more was done immediately, um, permanent and ubiquitous climate change on an unimaginable chaos on an unimaginable scale would result. There are many facets of the climate change mandate, of course, but certainly one that is a key priority to the UN community and also to many of the representatives here is how climate change creates ripple effects for peace and security issues. In the Sahel, these so-called climate security challenges, as we often refer to them, are certainly not a distant or future threat. They're something that have been affecting sources of violence and of human security for decades now. The Sahel has been heating up faster than many regions in the globe, with one degree Celsius of temperature rises since 1970 alone. There's also been more frequent and severe droughts, heat waves, and other natural disasters. This has contributed to a number or exacerbated a number of drivers of conflict, including climate migration, cross-border tensions, increased incidences of farmer herder conflicts as migratory patterns change, and also greater scarcity of arable land, which puts pressure overall competition for land and resources and also critically affects food security. If future climate, form, climate forecasts hold, it will only get worse. Temperatures in the Sahel are expected to increase at 1.5 times the rate of that in other parts of the globe. But the two thirds of the population in the Sahel that much learning to be done in exactly how to target this climate security nexus and also how to address the particular impacts for certain groups, for women, for migrant communities, and for others that are particularly vulnerable to climate shocks. What is needed is not just more funding and also more sustained funding, um, but also potentially a different way of doing business, a different way of thinking about how we are approaching the intersection of peace building environmentally. We have all here today a very esteemed panel of co-hosts and discussants to help us unpack some of these issues of climate security in the Sahel, and also to talk about ways that our multilateral system, ways that we as an international community could better address them in the future. Just to give you a quick run of show for today, um, because of UNGA week and, and all the busyness that comes with it, several of our ministers and representatives have been called into an important meeting with Secretary General at noon. So we'll be leaving us shortly, but replaced by uh, very competent contributors to the discussion. In addition, um, some of our representatives or ministers are still in the General Assembly right now listening to President Biden's speech. So we may have some latecomers in musical chairs, but we've still got such a depth of expertise and insights here that I know we're gonna have a fantastic discussion. So because of these scheduling issues, we're gonna hear first from the foreign minister from Senegal, from Ms. Isaiah Paul Saul. We'll then hear from three climate security and peace building experts from Ms. Elizabeth Spihar, who's the Assistant Secretary General for Peace Building Support, from the President and CEO of the International Crisis Group, Dr. Comfort Iro, and from the President of the International Committee for the Red Cross, Mr. Peter Maurer. We will then have a wonderful discussion and interchange between some of the ministers and representatives here. So starting first with Denmark's Minister of Foreign Affairs and our, our co-host really, who Denmark has been driving this event, um, Mr. Yeffi Kofod. From Mauritania's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Mauritanians abroad, um, Mr. Mohamed Salem Udmerzi. And then we will also hear from Germany's State Secretary and Special Envoy for International Climate Action, Ms. Jennifer Lee Morgan. From Norway's, um, Norway's Minister of Foreign Affairs is one of those who's tied up in the General Assembly. Um, but stepping in, we will be here from Elizabeth schwab Hans, who is the Director and Head of the Section for the Horn of Africa and for West Africa. So tremendous expertise for this panel. Um, after that, we'll have some open questions and discussions on all of these issues. So to start us off, I will give the floor to Her Excellency, Ms. Aida Talsal, for her observations on climate, peace, and security challenges in Senegal. Thank you so much. Thank you for welcoming us. Thank you to, thanks to Denmark and to my dear colleague. Allow me to address my speech in French, please. 
since we have translated, it will be <laughs> easier. <laughs> Excellence, mes chers homologues du Danemark et de la Mauritanie, Monsieur le Ministre, Monsieur, Madame, les participants, distingués amis, je voudrais remercier le Danemark pour avoir pris l'initiative de cette table ronde en collaboration avec l'Université des Nations Unies et l'Université d'Adelphi. Le Sénégal se félicite d'être parmi les co-organisateurs de cet événement avec le Danemark et le Niger. Au terme du dernier rapport du secrétaire général sur les activités du Bureau des Nations Unies pour l'Afrique de l'Ouest et le Sahel, situé à Dakar, plus de 6,2 millions de personnes sont déplacées au Sahel. Pour sa part, le chef du Bureau de coordination des affaires humanitaires estime qu'environ 30 millions de Sahéliens ont besoin d'aide et de protection cette année, soit plus de 2 millions supplémentaires qu'en 2021. Le tableau est donc sombre et nous devons agir très très vite et de façon coordonnée. C'est pourquoi nous devons travailler pour plus de synergie et de cohérence entre les multiples initiatives qui sont prises pour le Sahel. Les Nations Unies qui ont lancé la stratégie intégrée pour le Sahel, qui est assortie d'un plan d'action, devraient donc jouer un rôle majeur, et vous l'avez rappelé, et l'année est de même des organisations sous-régionales et régionales. La question du financement est le plus grand problème auquel nous devons faire face. Comment financer la paix Comment financer la sécurité Comment financer le développement au Sahel Nous avons reçu beaucoup de promesses, mais malheureusement, hélas, ces promesses-là tardent à se réaliser. Et je donne un exemple. Au 22 juin dernier, moins de 20% du financement qui était attendu a été assuré. Moins de 20%. Ce qui veut dire que 80% du financement reste à couvrir. C'est pourquoi je voudrais saluer la proposition de M. Guterres de doter le Fonds de consolidation de la paix des Nations Unies de 100 millions de dollars à titre de contribution statutaire par an et également à titre de contribution volontaire. Mais nous devons poursuivre les efforts. Nous devons aussi soutenir le G5 Sahel et la stratégie régionale en faveur de la stabilisation, du redressement et de la résilience des zones du bassin du lac Tchad touchées par le Boko Haram et donc le terrorisme. Le Sénégal, pour sa part, a contribué pour 2 millions de dollars américains pour le G5 Sahel. L'autre priorité que nous devons poursuivre, c'est l'approche préventive de tous ces problèmes au détriment de l'interventionnisme militaire. Enfin, et c'est le plus essentiel, tous nos efforts doivent être consentis de façon coordonnée, solidaire et en synergie avec tous les défis que nous rencontrons au Sahel. Je vous remercie de votre attention. So uh, wonderful. Thank you for those opening remarks. And I think you hit on some several key issues that we'll be taking up throughout the debate. I wish we could stay further, but I, I completely understand your other obligations. Yeah. Thank you so much. Now I have to, Merci, to, to, to run and go <laughs> to the other meeting. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Bonne continuation. Merci. Au revoir. Merci beaucoup. Um, we'll next turn to the other participant who also will have to leave us very shortly. Uh, Elizabeth Sihar to offer some comments. All right. Well, thank you so much. And, and first and foremost, apologies for, for needing to leave uh, quite soon. Uh, but uh, I'm very glad that I'm, I'm able to, uh, to be here for a few minutes. I'm very honored to have been invited. This is a really good event with a very, very distinguished group of, uh, of individuals uh, around the table, some of whom I know very well, others uh, not so well. but. Uh, we are all, uh, I know, very dedicated to these to these issues of um, combating climate change and also trying to understand the intersection between climate change and, and peace and security. Um, so I, I want to start off by thanking, of course, the organizers, uh, the Permanent Mission of Denmark, along with uh, Senegal and Niger, certainly UNU, uh, as well as Adelphi for, for putting this together. Um, I can tell you that this is, uh, this is an issue that the issue of, of the intersection of uh, climate change and peace and security that uh, the United Nations is focusing on, excuse me, <clears throat> is focusing on increasingly. 
Um, we're focusing on it increasingly uh, because we see the evidence of that intersection in so many parts of the world, but we're also focusing on it increasingly because that is what our member states are asking us to do. And I can say, I think with, with some confidence and we have some very distinguished um, uh, ministers and other senior officials from Africa, uh, in Africa, it is a sine qua non. Uh, the issue of which we sometimes call climate security is a somewhat controversial concept with some member states, but I have heard from uh, all of the African countries that, that this is a sine qua non. They, we're talking about a climate emergency that is destabilizing, that is causing uh, tensions and is causing conflicts on the, on the ground. Um, so as the Department of uh, Political and Peacebuilding Affairs, as well as within that department, uh, the Peacebuilding Support Office, uh, we, uh, we are really trying to, both in terms of, of research and thinking and guidance, but also in terms of actual support for initiatives on the ground, we are really uh, going into this issue uh, feet and hands, feet and hands first. So uh, let me just um, mention a few things I think are important to, to keep in mind in terms of this issue. Um, and, and you've mentioned several of them, uh, Erica, so thank you so much. Uh, first of all, in our approaches to this issue of climate security, if you will, um, inclusion and local ownership uh, are key. So these are the concepts that we need to, to use and to keep in mind in order to, to guide our way. Um, you, you said it a moment ago, in terms of the impact of climate change, including uh, the impact in relation to peace and security, not everyone is affected in the same way. Uh, we know, for example, that women uh, are often in, in the small villages, the ones who are responsible for going out and, and getting the water, providing the basic resources, um, fuel for cooking and so on. Um, they have the knowledge of their milieu um, and how to face as best possible these challenges, but they're often uh, most directly affected when they are trying to support their families and their and their societies. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been trying to do, for example, is to help um, member states in the Sahel uh, to to track the consequences of of climate change and this intersection with security, and particularly in um, in in cross border areas. So in various cross-border areas of, of the Sahel, for example, we have been helping uh, local communities to be able to monitor and track transhumans, right? So the, um, the movement of, 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 uh, of, of livestock and so forth. Um, and we've been also uh, training local people to be able to um, diffuse local conflicts based on the competition for resources between herders and farmers, for example, that have, uh, since the conditions are being increasingly exacerbated by climate change, which you very rightly pointed out, uh, the Sahel region is a particularly vulnerable one. This has also increased the incidences of tensions and conflict. So we are working directly um, in, in this way. Um, I also uh, wanted to mention a, a second point and Um, and that is that indeed uh, cross-border and regional engagement is absolutely critical. So even though we, we have problems on a country by country basis, we do see a lot of the vulnerabilities in the cross-border area. And this is where um, funds, mechanisms like the Peace Building Fund, which I'm very happy to say several of, of these. One of the things that we've, we've learned is that risk tolerance matters. Um, and I want to link that to the, one of the very important, of the many important points that the Foreign Minister of Senegal just made, and that is about financing, climate financing, uh, peace building financing, financing for prevention. It's still lamentably low, and particularly lamentably low in the countries that need it most, as she very, very well uh, pointed out. So I was just uh, on Monday uh, at the launch of the um, OECD DAX States of Fragility 2022 report. And they again underlined in the report how in conflict affected and fragile settings and fragile contexts, as they call it, um, only 4% of resources are going to prevention out of only 12% that's going to peace initiatives in the first place. Mm. So we talk about prevention 
in investing more in prevention and peace building, which is the Secretary General's call through our common agenda. And uh, we are just so lamentably far behind. I really hope that our common agenda and the new agenda for peace will be vehicles to, to collectively um, correct that. Um, so we, we see that in non-fragile states as well, um, and this is again using the OECD fragility uh, data, uh, non-fragile states still receive roughly 80 times more climate finance on a per capita basis than the highly fragile states. So I'm quite sure that as the minister was, was alluding to, the Sahel region and the Sahel countries are, they, we know that they're, they're, they're not very um, responsible in terms of contributing uh, to uh, carbon emissions and other um, uh, contributors to climate change, um, but they are receiving the lion's share of the problems and they are not receiving the lion's share of the resources. Um, so we know that for, for the private sector, but not only for the private sector, for many institutions, the riskier the place, the less you want to invest. Here our point is for the Sahel, as the minister was mentioning a moment ago, um, the greater risk is not to act. We need to find the resources for um, climate change uh, adaptation, for prevention, for peace building, and very much for climate security, uh, as we're trying to address it very much at community and, and local levels. Um, so I'm very pleased, as I said, uh, to say that, um, that the Peace Building Fund does have this risk tolerance, where we try to go in as soon as we are asked, and we hope that afterwards we have this catalytic effect and that others can come um, uh, behind us. Um, I would just um, finish by saying that um, we're very uh, happy to have uh, partners in UNU and others who are helping us to do right now, as we speak, um, a climate security thematic review. So we have, as a fund, put in well over $50 million into various climate security related uh, projects, uh, uh, mostly in Africa, but also a few elsewhere. And we're trying to learn from that to see how to do it better what is it even what what is this concept of climate security why is it important are the interventions that we are that we are supporting are they relevant and uh, that should be completed uh, by the spring of next year and i really hope that it will use uh, it will be useful for all of us to see how we move forward on this very very important um, uh, issue of the intersection of climate and peace and security. So thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. I think that put a lot of important issues on the table for us. I'm, I'm taking away the importance of thinking about cross-border and regional for our future discussion of looking at this issue of risk aversion in conflict affecting <clears throat> fragile states and also this, this need for practical action, for actually figuring out how are you energizing things with communities on the ground going beyond just talking about climate security. So I think we should take forward all of those points of discussion um, now we're going to go rapid fire to two of our other kind of expert contributors. Um, we're a little behind schedule, so urging keep comments to the to a few minutes. But next, we'll hear from Crisis Group CEO Comfort Hero. Thank you very much, and thank you for thank you. inviting me. And, and it, I mean, Elizabeth, it's hard to follow you because you said it, said all the key things, and I look forward to, to talking to you further later as well. Thank, thank you, you so very much as well. Um, I mean, I think most of the key issues have, have been put on the table. I mean, I, I think. You, you wanted me to set the scene, um, and I think we all know the reality that is confronting the Sahel um, today. You know, as we speak, the deteriorating situation in Burkina Faso, um, in Mali, you know, two coups um, within the space of nine months with the full glare of the international community. And I think the big question for us also is how you protect and show up country so that we don't see the spillover of conflict from one country to another. When you when you hear it the way in which Elizabeth explained it about the, the cross-border realities confronting the Sahel, you begin to understand the gravity of it. So we asked the question, Minister, and I acknowledge your the presence of, uh, of the Minister of Niger. We asked a question about 10 years ago, a crisis group, and I think it was- no, Mauritania. Mauritania. Uh, sorry, for, for, for Mauritania also, but also for Senegal. And, uh, and Niger, but also for Mali, about how do we protect all the countries in the region from seeing a spillover um, of the conflict? And now the other question we have to ask is then, how do we make sure that the climate um, responses are not just within those borders, but also um, respond to all the threats that we see across the, 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 the region as well? Um, I think 
three things for us to bear in mind, and Elizabeth said it um, herself. Um, in terms of understanding climate change um, for us as a threat multiplier, I think there are three ways in which you can in which you can understand it. First is how it relates to heightened um, sort of livelihood insecurity as well. Um, I give the example of Nigeria, um, which is in a sense part of the Sahel, particularly the northern part of Nigeria, where we've seen um, in the last few years a succession of tensions between herders and farmers in that in that region, and like largely because of livelihood situation, the competition um, for access to grazing land, um, the, the competition for access to where um, herders can search for pasta and water, um, the competition between farmers who are trying to modi uh, modernize um, their own um, ability to, to farm, and that is causing tensions between um, the, the herder farmer community, but it's also um, causing tension southwards into the <laughs> middle belt. So although we, although Elizabeth was right to spotlight uh, the, the, the cross-border element, there are also cross-border elements within countries that we need to, need to think about, and that speaks to the livelihood insecurity issues as well, and how to deal with the dispute around that. The second one, very quickly, um, Erica, is around um, displacement, it's a, and it's a, it's a real issue. Again, with displacement within the, the countries, but also, also across um, the countries as well. One of the things that I think we should be paying attention to um, is the change um, in the sort of in the in the water pattern and the build up in the Niger um, River, for, for example, and the deterioration of vegetation um, that is also pushing herder and farmers um, into a very tiny sort of um, space, and they're seeking refu refuge in certain park areas like the Park of the um, 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 area in, in the Niger County again. Again, it's about livelihood, but again, it's about space. Again, it's about managing um, the, the competition around the need to use um, scarce resources to deal um, with, with tensions as well. And then the third one, I think, the one that should be a wake up call to all of us, given the, 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 the extent of insecurity um, in the Sahel region, is the fact that um, as a result of the weakness, oftentimes, of central government to act um, in good time, um, mili mili militias, rebels, mm. are stepping <clears throat> in where the, where the government aren't able to act. And in fact, I've become proto-states, um, providing the services um, that governments can't, can't respond to. And it's, it's showing in relation to the climate change as well. And it's showing also in, in the way in which rebels themselves can negotiate um, access to water, access to land, access to resources as well. They're the ones that citizens are having to turn to to get to get to use this space as well. And they have a leverage over the government because when the government is absent on the cross-border areas, in the peripheries, it's the rebels who are stepping into that. Three quick responses to that in terms of lessons learned because you asked that, that question. And I have to say that the G5 Alliance has provided some kind of important guidance in terms of resilience. But I would say that we should understand that climate change is a global phenomenon. It's not specific to this. It's not specific to the Sahel, but the response is guided by the by the by local conflict dynamics, especially um, in the Sahel. So whatever we recommend for one part of the world, we have we cannot sort of transport it to the Sahel because of the specificity of its own climate dynamics. The second quick point um, worth noting. Um, um, Eric, and it will not surprise any of you for me saying this because it's crisis group as well. So we need to identify the pathways um, that lead to climate um, climate change within the, the specific com, um, context in which we're dealing with as well. So whatever we, we're suggesting for the Sahel, we can't ex expand it to any other region. It's very specific to, to the Sahel. And I think the third one um, is that just as much as we, and I heard Elizabeth, and I'm glad Elizabeth noted that only 4% of money is going towards um, conflict prevention. Um, what concerns us also is that we need to improve our early warning system around climate security specifically, mm -hmm. not climate change writ large, but climate security and understand the connections between, between the two and you know, urge our ministers also um, to start thinking about how we can um, make sure that we have a more robust early warning system, but not just a robust early warning system, but how we can respond 
anticipate the risk, but also define the policy that accompany our anticipation of those risks as well. And, I, and you know, this is something that Crisis Group is working, sort of trying to think through, and I'd be quite happy to just discuss that. And I do believe that the G5 Alliance is really thinking about resilience and early warning in a very interesting way. And I'm glad that we've got um, the, the ministers around the table to provide practical evidence to how we're managing those things. I'll stop there because it's rapid fire and you said three minutes and I wanted to stay within your within your three minutes. No, but thank that was so wonderful. Much. I put a lot of issues on the table. So thank you. And I'm going to, yes, immediately go to Peter Mauer to offer some, some additional thoughts. Well, from my side as well, uh, thanks a lot uh, for the opportunity and uh, uh, great to be with you, uh, with you today. Yeah, the, the ICRC works at this intersection uh, of climate change, uh, armed conflict and violence where people are experiencing all the three at the same time. And what we see in the Sahel is very much what my colleagues have mentioned as well, but three things first and foremost, all countries in the region considered most vulnerable to climate shock are at the same time involved in armed conflict or experiencing armed conflict. Secondly, the convergence of shocks is felt dramatically on people's lives, as well as institution and social cohesion, and they threaten development achievements, which ha we have seen over the last decades. And thirdly, despite clear vulnerabilities, and it has mentioned by all of you before, actors that are best equipped to use climate finance and support climate adaptation are largely absent mm -hmm. from uh, the response because of security risks mm -hmm. that they are experiencing. Communities in the Sahel are amongst the most resilient in the world, mm -hmm. but in the face of compound shock, they now walk on a tightrope of survival. Their message is clear when we listen what they tell us. They want more generous support during emergencies, but more importantly, they want pathways to self-sufficiency self and autonomous lives. And I think we have to hear both messages. At the front line of humanitarian action, we see that humanitarian work is a vital stabilizing factor in this fragmented environment but it is only a building block towards stabilization. And very frankly, whenever I'm in this discussion, I'm really humbled because at the end of the day, we know that we can't do it alone. We need different types of coordinations and partnerships. Our urgent priority is to work together for impact. Mm. We may all agree on, and, and it has been articulated, uh, on the basics, but the stumbling block is still how exactly do we organize a collective response for impact mm -hmm. amongst all the different perspectives and actors, which in the general terms all agree on the analysis that we are seeing. I try maybe to highlight one experience from other ex uh, projects that we have been running in Africa, which are a little bit more innovative on how we could eventually work together. And what we have learned, for instance, in, in the DRC and, uh, and in other parts in the Horn of Africa is that we need really to bring collaboration at a different level. And what is the essential? It's, yes, the humanitarian development funds but it is also the grant and credit that we have to combine in a different way. And it's the public and private tools available. And what I find so interesting in some of the recent successful exercises looking at better impact that we have combined philanthropic seed money, which was then topped up by grant, which was pop up, pop, top, top up by private sector investment mm. at the same time. And it's this value chain of different instruments that we still have huge problems of building together. And I think it's not a question of institutional coordination, but it is really a question of how we bring the tools and instruments together 
so that uh, we see impact. And I see three practical solutions that can make us more successful in doing so. <coughs> First, really put up people at the center of what we are trying to do and listen carefully what they need. We are still, all of us, in a mode of developing and unfolding and rolling out instruments independently of what the, the real needs and the articulation of these real needs are. And we have to change the logic. Secondly, we have to share knowledge and align complementarity experiences. Humanitarians can help other actors bring conflict sensitive lenses to their own work and address some of the risks that limit their action in this context. And thirdly, we need to explore new financing mechanisms that bring states, the private sector, humanitarian and development actors, in finding new and more meaningful tools to better deliver services and address needs. Mm -hmm. And here, very frankly, I, I really am addressing myself to the Northern Ministerial representation around this table. Because if I have one experience over the last couple of years where I tried so hard, for instance, to bring the World Bank and ICRC to work together, we see that the details of rules and regulations within each institution are obstacles to this fluid cooperation for people and for impact. And it needs governance decisions at the center to give the space so that we can do what we intellectually know is the right thing to do. And I think I really wanted to encourage you, look at the detail. We have gone over week and month of negotiation and best intentions amongst the staff of ICRC and the World Bank. And in some places we have been able to unlock, but in other places at the end of the day, we, we saw that we needed governance decisions mm -hmm. and governance leadership and allow governance creating that space that we can test, that we can explore. And this is about risk taking and it's about managing insecurity and it's about also allowing us that we get a little bit of breathing space uh, to try out and then to see what really works. Mm -hmm. I'll stop it. Wonderful. Thank you. And that is a great segue, actually, um, to my next question and our next feature. Um, so this is directed to you, Your Excellency, uh, the Foreign Minister from Denmark. And for these, these questions of how do we do this? How do we have better governance leadership on there? How do we, we can't do it alone? How do we do it better as a system? Is I think particularly important because, of course, Denmark has been a leader on, you know, generally the green agenda on sustainability globally. It may have some opportunities for promoting this governance leadership if it looks to join the Peace Building Commission in January 2023, or potentially in future cycles if, you know, there is a successful bid to join the Security Council. So taking that into the consideration, what are the opportunities that the multilateral system, what are the opportunities for it to do more on climate security issues? and to more systematically address the repeated threats and vulnerabilities. Well, th thank you, uh, Eric, and, and thank you so, to, my, to our experts and also the ASG. Um, brilliant opening remarks, and, and we hear uh, your call as well, also on um, obstacles and government structures, and, and also pay attention to the details, to, so we're not only talking about the, the, the big picture. Um, so very timely question that you posed. Um, so let me um, share uh, three points uh, on how we can we push forward climate, peace and security in the UN and then proceed to outline some hopes and also ambitions that uh, uh, Denmark's membership for the Peace Building Commission and our candidacy for the Security Council. Um, and I, I do not want to start by you know, explaining the interlinkage between climate, peace, and security, you mm. because you always <coughs> talked about that in, in detail uh, brilliantly. Um, all of us, although I think some more than others, uh, have felt the dire and also destabilizing effects of extreme drought and flood, floods and scarce uh, access to natural resources uh, and, and not least the loss of life. So we see that. Um, and clearly for the UN, 
to lift its triple mandate on development, security, and human rights, we must consider the effect of climate change on that. Uh, so my, to my first point, this is to my first point, the effect of climate change needs to be factored in um, pretty much everything we do uh, in fragile and, 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 and conflict settings. Uh, you also touched upon that, uh, Peter, from humanitarian uh, development efforts to stabilization efforts and the promotion of gender equality and human rights. We know this is still controversial to some. Last year, a widely supported Security Council resolution on, on climate, peace, and security failed to be passed, as we recall. Um, but good colleagues, uh, including also Peace Building Commission and Security Council, uh, in the Security Council has shown us the way forward. That brings me to the second point. Um, we need to be guided by the needs of, of the people uh, and, and countries who are most affected by climate change and conflict, and also to build some lessons, that we're already starting that, uh, build some lessons from the ground. Um, we, when we uh, do that, we uh, deplete um, the climate security from political and ideological uh, strides, and I think that's important. When countries in their national capacity has asked for support from the UN to address issues related to climate, peace and security, there uh, has been no or almost no divisions uh, in the response. So my third and actually fourth and fifth point with Ramita is data, data and data. I mean, uh, to act together, we need strong shared understanding of the most urgent priorities and challenges. We need to know uh, what works where, and we need to uh, read data, we need evidence uh, on this. So when Denmark enters the Peace Building Commission in, in January, um, and as we also launch our candidature for a seat in the UN Security Council for the period of 25, 26, we will seek to work on this nexus on climate and security um, in an evidence-based um, manner and by working with uh, those countries and people um, who are the most vulnerable uh, to the effect of climate change, women, youth, IDPs, migrants, or other marginalized groups who bear the, the, the burden of violence and climate, and, and they will be our informants, our briefers, and our advocates. So um, my colleagues from the Sahel region, um, one of the regions hardest hit by climate change in the world. Your insights and experiences will, will lead then Denmark's engagement also in that. So, so I look forward um, to learn and, and share experiences with, with you here today. So thank you so much. Wonderful. And, and that's actually a, a really great um, transition to our next speaker, um, the, His Excellency from Mauritania. And you know, there's been a lot of discussion so far um, about how important it is to involve communities and to really build a from ground experiences, learning and understanding. And as I understand it in Mauritania, there is a particularly active civil society, media, incredibly strong community tradition. <laughs> How do we bring those voices into these international and national discussions about climate change and policy? How do we include communities more and really build and support them in community resilience? Merci. Bonjour, je voudrais dire que je suis très heureux d'être parmi vous ici et de m'apprendre beaucoup de choses. Je voudrais aussi remercier les the Denmark and University of the Unique Organization debate extremely utile, surtout for nous qui venons du Sahel. Donc, ce que je voudrais dire, c'est que le, comme l'a dit le collègue, en effet, quand on parle de l'évaluation de la l'atténuation de l'impact du changement climatique ou de la, de la mitigation plutôt à l'échelle mondiale. Mais je pense que la situation au niveau du Sahel est une situation particulière. Et on parle souvent de crise au niveau du Sahel. Moi, je pense que le, le terme le plus approprié, c'est polycrise. On a plusieurs crises à la fois qui se euh, interposent et qui font un effet qu'on a beaucoup discuté. Je voudrais rappeler que Euh, D'abord, le Sahel couvre à peu près une superficie de 3, euh, de 3 millions, 53 millions de kilomètres carrés. 
regroupe une bonne, très bonne dizaine de, très bonne dizaine de pays, Burkina Faso, le Tchad, les Érythrées, la Gambie, le Guinée-Bissau, le Mali, la Bretagne, etc. Euh, et que c'est une, euh, une région qui, 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 a, qui subit le, le plus fort impact du changement climatique euh, au niveau de, au niveau de, sa, au niveau de sa population. Et que l'impact de ce changement climatique est très visible. Euh, parce qu'il euh, exacerbe la dégradation, donc l'accès à la dégradation des ressources euh, naturelles, la régression de la biodiversité végétale et animale, l'insécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle, la vulnérabilité des populations, l'exode rural, euh, la migration, les coûts des conflits d'accès, qui sont eux aussi une autre forme de violence. Euh, de, donc c'est un, un tableau difficile. Et euh, cette situation euh, s'est dégradée à cause de deux, de deux facteurs qui sont récents. Euh, D'abord, un, euh, c'est l'impact de la COVID-19 COVID qui a eu un effet dévastateur sur la population et la guerre à l'Ukraine. Donc ça a beaucoup accéléré la dégradation. Des... Et donc on, on considère, nous, et que ces deux facteurs qui sont des facteurs exogènes sont de devenir en fait des facteurs à la fois de conflit, parce qu'ils limitent les ressources, ils aggravent les facteurs que cela pourrait donc, pourrait donc avoir, et ils sont même source de violence. Et c'est ça qui fait, que, euh, qui fait que les problèmes sont, sont, sont extrêmement difficiles. Et donc ce que je voudrais dire par rapport à ça, malgré... Euh, les difficultés que nous avons, le Sahel offre plusieurs opportunités malgré tout. Et je veux en citer ici trois. Il y a trois bonnes, trois bonnes, trois bonnes opportunités que je voudrais vous citer. D'abord, un, euh, c'est qu'on dispose malgré tout d'immenses ressources naturelles qui existent à différents niveaux, qui doivent être exploitées. Euh, la deuxième opportunité qui est donc offerte, euh, c'est la possibilité d'exploiter de façon équitable ces euh, ressources. C'est la deuxième opportunité qui s'offre à nous. Euh, la troisième, euh, c'est euh, euh, de sécuriser aussi euh, les performances des systèmes de production. Ça, c'est une opportunité qui s'offre à nous. Il y a euh, une difficulté qui se greffe à ça, c'est que dans l'ensemble de ces pays dont on vient de parler, il se pose un problème sérieux euh, qui est donc le, ce qu'on appelle, qui est donc connu pour le, ceux qui travaillent sur le développement, la gestion de la transition démographique. C'est que le grand problème aussi, c'est qu'il se pose au niveau de l'Ontario, c'est un problème démographique. Euh, le, taux de le taux de fécondité dans certains pays comme le Niger, il est à peu près à 7-8, ce qui est énorme, euh, alors que la moyenne mondiale, vous savez, elle tourne autour d'un brille 5 à 2 euh, maximum. Et donc, c'est ce qui fait aussi ça. Et quelles sont les leçons qu'il va falloir tirer D'abord, je réponds à la question qui a été posée par la directrice de Crisis Group. En tout cas, nous, par rapport à ce qui se passe au niveau, euh, au niveau du Sahel, comme vous le savez, je crois, nous sommes aujourd'hui le seul pays de la Mauritanie, le seul pays le plus stable, le seul pays qui, a, qui, a, qui, qui maintient l'inviolabilité de ses frontières par rapport à l'ensemble de ces groupes-là. Et c'est le plus grand pays qui accueille sur son territoire le plus, le plus grand nombre de réfugiés, réfugiés maliens. 85 000 qui sont aujourd'hui et qui vivent là depuis une bonne vingtaine d'années et qui vivent et qui, et qui sont et qui sont, sont bien et je, je parle euh, dans le sud-est du pays dans ce qu'on appelle le camp de le camp de Mbr, dans le sud-est de la et toutes les agences des Nations Unies travaillent là-bas euh, le UNHCR il y a le PAM euh, il y a toutes les coopérations coopération allemande je crois probablement des danoises beaucoup beaucoup de pays travaillent et donc et c'est le, le camp de Mbr montre que le naufrage du Sahel, c'est emblématique de ça. C'est-à-dire qu'il y a un problème de sécurité au niveau du Mali, mais qui pose par ailleurs le problème humanitaire. Voilà. Donc il y a un, un double défi sécuritaire, mais en même temps humanitaire. Et c'est ça qui fait qu'aujourd'hui, le, le camp de Mbr est un peu... Nous, euh, on, on, a, on a réussi parce que 
on a apporté euh, euh, trois réponses à ce, ce que nous, on a connu en 2009, 2010, 2011. On a connu beaucoup d'attentats. D'abord, une réponse militaire et sécuritaire. J'ai entendu dire que ce n'est pas important, mais c'est très important. Je crois que ça fait partie de la construction de la paix que les gens peuvent, peuvent se défendre. Euh, mais euh, en respectant euh, les droits humains, c'est ce qui s'est accepté au niveau de ça. La deuxième réponse qui est très importante, c'est la réponse politique, c'est la gouvernance une bonne gouvernance qui peut être faite. Et la troisième réponse qu'on peut donc apporter ça, c'est une réponse de déradicalisation, de, de, de désendoctrinement. C'est donc à peu, à, peu, à, peu, à peu près ça. Et je voudrais dire aussi par rapport à ça, euh, c'est que euh, euh, aujourd'hui, au niveau du Sahel, il n'y a pas une violence, il y a des violences, plusieurs types, plusieurs types de violences. Il est vrai que les gens se focalisent sur l'aspect sur l'aspect religieux. Euh, sûrement, euh, il y a donc un aspect euh, religieux là-dedans. Mais quand on voit euh, les différentes formes de violence et de crise qui sont là-bas, il y a l'aspect religieux. Il y a le repli identitaire qu'on peut observer dans certains pays, comme le nord du Mali. Euh, on l'observe aussi dans il y a euh, des de, de replis et des plis, je veux dire, des étriques ici. Il y a une euh, troisième caractéristique de cette violence aussi, c'est l'injustice économique. Euh, la, la quatrième raison qui peut aussi être observée, c'est l'injustice sur le plan climatique. Elle pose en effet quelques, pose en effet quelques difficultés. Et donc, je, ce, ce que je souhaite, moi en tout cas, c'est que pour l'avenir, que quand on jette un regard sur la région du Sahel et l'Afrique, pas seulement, on observe ça au niveau de la région des Grands Lacs, au niveau de certains autres pays, qu'on est à l'esprit qu'il n'y a pas une seule violence, il y a plusieurs types de violences. Et que donc les facteurs qui président à ça, elles sont, elles, cela aussi évolue, ça change. Et il est vrai qu'au début des années 2010, c'est. Euh, c'est le Qaïda, c'est le... vrai, il existe, il existe, mais il y a malheureusement de nouveaux groupes, surtout il faut qu'on sache qu'il y a une sorte de démilitarisation même de la violence au niveau, au niveau du Sahel. Et comme cela a été dit, la, la, vraie, la vraie dégradation de l'État central, elle, 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 elle aussi elle accélère ce, 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 ce processus qu'on on observe à ce, à ce, à ce niveau-là. Qu'est-ce qui... Euh, donc, nous, la, 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 la réponse dans le pays, sur, sur, sur quoi euh, on peut donc agir de façon, de, de, de façon rapide On soutient naturellement euh, ce fonds consolidé qui doit être amené pour la consolidation de la paix au niveau des, des Nations Unies. Moi, j'ai dit au secrétaire général des Nations Unies, je crois, il y a, il y a deux jours, je lui ai dit qu'au niveau du Sahel, on a l'INOAS. Mm -hmm. euh, pour moi, on doit élargir sa mission. Il doit traiter de deux choses qui sont, de mon point de vue, un peu, un peu importantes. Euh, C'est la mise en place. Euh, il y a le crisis group, il y a beaucoup de... On met en place un groupe qu'on fait de très haut niveau qui travaille sur l'identification des risques liés au climat. Comme pour faire, mettre en place un système d'alerte précoce par rapport à ça. De, de, deuxième chose qui peut aussi être faite, mais de, de, dans un c'est la mise en place d'un système d'alerte précoce. C'est des risques li, liés au conflit. Parce que si la situation se dégrade, déjà, je vous dis que pour retourner à l'ordre, euh, c'est l'aspect le plus difficile. Donc, deux systèmes d'alerte, un système d'alerte précoce sur les risques du climat, un système d'alerte précoce sur euh, les, 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 sur les, les risques qui sont donc liés, euh, qui sont liés au... Dans ce cadre-là, en effet, la société civile et les, 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 les mouvements associatifs, surtout dans notre pays, de, 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 jouent un rôle important. D'abord, jouent un rôle dans ce groupe. C'est parce que ces groupes violents, qu'ils soient les terroristes, les terroristes, les groupes religieux, 
le rôle, c'est la déconstruction des fils de la cohésion de la société. Et de la société, le, et ils détruisent les États. Et donc, le rôle de la société civile, c'est d'être un peu le, le vrai gendarme euh, qui, 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 donc pose, qui, qui, qui pose les députés. Nous, on a une société civile qui est donc renforcée, qui est totalement libre d'ailleurs de choisir. Nous sommes l'un des rares pays où aucune ONG n'a besoin d'être autorisé pour, pour travailler. Tout est ouvert. Les sociétés sont, sont donc organisées. Et ça me semble aller dans l'autre. Je, je m'excuse d'avoir plus de temps, mais je suis heureux d'être là dans une université parce que je suis un professeur d'université oui, oui. et je suis aussi heureux parce que je suis ministre aussi des Affaires étrangères. Donc ça m'a fait. Oui. Ça m'a fait, oui. ça fait donc, euh, non, vous avez beaucoup de choses importantes. Oui, ça me fait donc plaisir. Et je suis, M. l'ambassadeur, on a malheureusement une question. Mais s'il y a une question rapide à vous poser, je vais vous poser la question sur la société civile. So now I, I would like to turn just, we want to get the important views as well from, from Norway and from Germany. So um, first, Ms. Morgan, if you wouldn't mind um, commenting, and you have such a depth of experience as I understand it in this field. And I know within Germany and particularly as you know, there's been a debate about the new national security strategy, mm -hmm. climate security risks have been a big part of that debate. How do you see Germany's investments or support for climate security unfolding going forward in light of that debate? Well, thank you, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here and to, to listen um, and hear from people who are working on the ground. And uh, thanks to Denmark, our close, close collaborator on many, many issues. Um, and um, university, I think, you know, we are now in the process of doing a comprehensive national security strategy. It was actually launched um, shortly after, just two weeks after the unlawful Russian aggression on Ukraine. And um, in it, Minister Baerbach, who's our foreign minister, she was quite clear. She defined the climate crisis as the greatest security in uh, crisis, greatest, greatest threat to international peace, mm -hmm. international security stabil and stability. And we're now in the process of kind of thinking through and consulting with civil society, with uh, obviously with all stakeholders, relevant ministries. But it's pretty clear livelihoods is going to be a very mm -hmm. core part of that um, strategy. Um, and I think in the types of climate related risks, I mean, we heard here about Obviously, the, the climate impacts on water and, and food and energy um, uh, shortages and extreme weather events and uh, you know, the migra migratory patterns um, and uh, the pressures that come in there. And um, so we're uh, aware of that. I think the other piece maybe to bring into the discussion, which I think adds in, is the um, security relevant and geologic geological impacts um, that reach from so-called tipping points. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the literature there, I mean, there was just an update on that um, I think last week from uh, the Potsdam Institute and others mm -hmm. that really look at, okay, um, what are those points of no return that come in? I mean, whether it be within the Amazon, whether it be from glaciers, and also, of course, looking at um, uh, soil erosion and drought and uh, water insecurity in the Sahel or the Horn of mm -hmm. Africa. So I think how do we reduce, this is also looking at how do we reduce uh, climate security risks? Well, I think first of all, climate policy um, itself is um, a preventive security mm -hmm. policy and mm -hmm. we see that very much. Um, and it's a way of mitigating or at least managing these risks. and. I think that um, climate and environmental production protection are really preconditions for stabilizing our international order um, and and uh, the aim of really maintaining peace and security in the world. And that's in our geopolitical interest. And I think that's very important when you're doing a national security strategy to mm -hmm. actually see that our efforts as part of a global effort to reduce emissions, to take climate policy are also in our own national security interests uh, and, and of others. And you know that we have to keep 1.5 um, very much alive, and um, I think that's the the best way to reduce climate 
uh, induced uh, conflicts um, in the in the community, and that's where we're working very hard um, and have built up and accelerate our own energy transition. Also, having of course and not of course in this moment, taking a, having to take some uh, short term measures to to ensure our energy security, but also just want to be. Uh, reassuring people that our commitment to our climate goals has not gone away. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the other obviously is building resilience um, across the board. And um, so that's, you know, disaster risk reduction, adaptive capacity, allowing countries to cope better uh, with climate related event events before they become the security challenges. And so our flagship initiative we have, uh, which we work with other colleagues here in the room is the weathering risk. Uh, initiative and it's a multidisciplinary innovative initiative that you it basically unites the data um, mm -hmm. which is so important and really looking ahead um, to see okay where where could these um, conflicts be coming where are the uh, impacts happening both cross-border but also within different parts of countries uh, and also bringing that with um, external conflict analysis so we're mm -hmm. thinking that the climate impacts potential and the conflict analysis together and then have capacity support tools, dialogues, and trainings um, to try and make that relevant on the ground. So it's not just giving the data, it's actually really hands-on work that I think we're working to try and promote peace and resilience there. And that's co-led by Adelphi and by the Potsdam um, Institute and supported by Denmark and Norway and Ireland um, and the UK and uh, Colombia, actually. Um, and so that's a key part, um, there's a peace pillar which actually also has um, direct implementation moving on the ground, uh, designing, piloting, evaluating different peace programs that integrate climate security risk analysis and really bring the climate right into peace building missions. So we're working with you on that as well and looking how we can maybe increase our, our work in that area. So it's about now, you know, turning, turning that risk analysis into action. Mm -hmm. Um, as part of our G7 presidency, we've um, launched a uh, climate, environment, peace, and security initiative. And that's really looking at, okay, we've done a lot and learned a lot, but how can we coordinate better? How can we actually be connecting the dots more um, and coordinate support in countries um, with those high climate-related risks uh, across the board on concrete projects? And we're actually formally going to be uh, establishing that at the upcoming Berlin Climate and Security Conference in uh, October. Um, and I think also, you know, it's part of the political uh, and work that we do as part of um, co-chairing with Nairu, the group of friends on climate and security. So that's also obviously here mm -hmm. uh, a big piece. And um, that's even more important with the voting down of the resolution. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, looking at a just a whole of government approach, looking across the board, trying to bring those different pieces together um, from the big picture, okay, our national security strategy into really how we can be scaling up the work on the ground in a way of integrating it, integrating it in while making our own um, citizens aware of these connections, which is challenging. I mean, and I think the migration work that's, that's happening and how we do that in a sensitive way that actually also supports communities on the ground um, is, is a topic. Um, and then our final speaker, and which may actually be the final, <laughs> because we're almost at time and a lot of our ministers have to leave, but, it, but it's actually excellent because, you know, what I would ask, you know, Norway, of course, has been an important champion of climate issues in its, in its term of the Security Council. Um, so it would be really important to have some reflections on, you know, what progress has been made in, in forwarding this issue, but also where are there outstanding blockages? What do we need to work on more? And then relatedly, particularly in your position, since you're the director and heading the desk that's in looking at policies in Sahel and West Africa, how, how are we seeing these issues be realized in practice? What more could we be done on the ground? Well, thank you very much for that yeah. question. And, and apologies on behalf of my minister who couldn't make it here. Um, in the interest of time, I'll be really, really brief. First of all, I want to say we, we kind of inherited the climate mm. and security portfolio from Germany um, and, and tried to bring your work forward. And we are truly hoping that Denmark will carry sure. the torch if you yes. are successful in your bit. Uh, so, so that's, uh, that's, I apologize that's for what, leaving you, but, you know. uh, but I leave it in good hands. <laughs> <laughs> Until we can possibly hand it back to you. So. <laughs> 
So what has been achieved? I think, first of all, the fact that, that we're not talking about it in this kind of context, mm -hmm. that, that is a major achievement. Mm -hmm. This is not the conversation just a couple of years ago. Um, the establishment of an informal work, expert working group within the council, I think, has is, is been able to push the agenda somewhat. We've been trying to target all of the country resolution, all of the mandates, trying to get in as much language as possible. So the thematic resolution, unfortunately, was voted down. Uh, but we've managed to get every, every place here and there, small language on how to move it forward starting with the preambulas and then moving it into the operational paragraphs. And, and that's sort of the way that you can sort of chip off the block uh, steadily. So for instance, in the case of South Sudan, uh, it's now part of the mission's reporting mandate. And that, that is significant because that means then you can start to tailor responses as well. Um, and in terms of what can we do better, I think we really have to look at how do you prevent. And this morning there was a there was an event on on the responding to humanitarian needs on the Horn. I know last year see was also a part of that. Uh, it it was warned. I mean we it's been seen coming. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, it's so difficult to address it before. Um, so increasing funding for climate resilience, all of the issues that have been raised around the table. But I do think that it's also incredibly important not to lose the governance issues out of sight mm -hmm. um and that's that's one particular area that we've been quite keen to bring up in our conversations with partners particularly partners in the region uh, and the member states in the region because it, it does matter and then if you build that down into how you manage your resources in terms of land water or otherwise you can also use that as a peace building project. Mm -hmm. You can use that, and I, I very much take the point that you made, and then which is made by several around the table, you need to understand the local context. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you can build specifics around addressing that particular context. Mm -hmm. You can build maybe more confidence between the different communities and then from there move on. Um, so just on the Security Council, I just wanted to raise one more issue because we had two main priority, uh, two of our main priorities out of the four were, were climate and security and then women, peace and security. Um, in Sahel, these are very much part of everything that we do. In Sahel, in terms of our development uh, collaboration, it's very much geared towards now food security issues, which obviously will have to put much more uh, adaptation and resilience um, interventions into. But it's also girls' education. Mm. And that was raised, I think, by, by the Minister of Mauritania. It was also raised by, by uh, the Foreign Minister of Niger when we met in earlier, is that you have to prioritize girls' education. Um, so, so these things go together, but they have to be looked at comprehensively. They have to work together. Um, and then if we then underline the issues of governance and human rights as well, mm. I think we have a building block for moving it forward. And we certainly do hope that, that Denmark will be able to take that forward. And I wish to end by just saying thank you to all the partners around the table for the wonderful collaboration that we've had on this issue. And we really look forward to taking it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great, uh, comprehensive, taking it from both ends mm. remarks. I really appreciate it. Um, we had initially planned, hoped to have a little bit more back and forth and follow on questions, mm. but we're actually at the hour for where we're supposed to be. And I have been under strict order since everyone has busy UNGA sessions mm -hmm. to end this on time, but we have lunch here and we would hope for all of the participants to join us and continue the conversation. What I'll just say as a wrap up is I think that what's been highlighted is not only, you know, obviously one of the really important things that several speakers raised was the gap in financing, particularly in conflict and climate affected and the need to really do something urgently and as as mr mauer said to not just think about it in terms of public funding but private funding to be creative in terms of thinking about how we actually get the resources down to the ground and quite urgently also obviously huge gaps in terms of knowing how to sync together our responses in terms of environment and conflict risk and all the other things like you pointed out girls education, good governance, all of these other components that also play into whether you're actually successful in addressing the climate security risks that manifest. Mm -hmm. But then hugely, and this came across at so many points, was this issue of governance. So mm -hmm. governance at the international level, international leadership on this issue, now it is more of a priority, but making it even more, even more of one and continuing that. Mm -hmm. Governance at a regional level, addressing these transnational cross-border flows and having regional systems of management 
that are able to work on not just the climate effects, but also the security implications, the armed group networks, the transnational crime, but also ways that human security are flowing across borders and, and affecting issues. And then finally, at a local governance, because in so many of the areas that are really the most vulnerable and are borne the greatest brunt, many of them are left to their own devices. They have very little infrastructure, governance, or other coping needs. So figuring out ways to be able to extend resources and governance to those communities. Um, this has been incredibly rich and thoughtful debate. I'm going to really enjoy getting to talk with all of you over lunch afterwards. Um, but thank you all for taking part. Thank you for those of you who joined us online and observed this. Um, and I hope we can continue this discussion at another point. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.